Good morning, Restore, and welcome to our virtual service. I want to say up front, Merry Christmas. This is Christmas week, and I hope you are able to enjoy this season, even despite the year that we've had. Now, today we're going to focus on love, which is our fourth Advent candle. And so we're going to do that all throughout our service today as we do the same four things we always do, which is focus on the Word of God, the worship of God, the community of God, and the mission of God. Now, when we gather corporately, we, sell, we practice those four things by opening up God's Word to see what He would say to us, by celebrating God through a time of worship, and today we'll be sung over by our musicians, and I'd encourage you to participate in the songs that they sing, including some Christmas carols. We hear what's going on in our community through a time of announcements, and we encourage one another to live on mission. So as we begin our service today, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for all that you've blessed us with, for the greatness of who you are that we get to see and experience in a difficult year, Lord, but a year where you have still moved and we have still seen so much of your work and your handiwork. Be with us, Lord, in all that we do. I pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning, Restore. Thanks for tuning in. Would you just join us and sing some Christmas songs this morning? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. Wonders of His love. 
God, thank you so much for this day, for this time that we can worship you as one voice, no matter where we are, God, that you can be glorified. And God, as we just sing this next song, I pray that we remember the night that you sent your son, um, because it was such a holy night, God. Well, two things that I wanted to share with you during this time of announcements. The first is we've been so blessed at Restore that in the last month, two new babies have been born to our congregation. 
And when that happens, what we try to do is we set up meals for those families so that they don't have to stress about the, uh, you know, just even finding food on the table. If you remember when you had a newborn, how difficult that can be. So we have these meal trains set up. You should have received several emails about that. There are still some spots to be filled on them. So if you haven't done it yet, it's super easy, especially this year because so many restaurants are delivering. And so you can send a gift card or you can have food delivered from one of their favorite restaurants, which are all listed on the meal trains. So if you haven't gotten those emails, please email linda at restoreworship.org and she will be able to send you the link so that you can go sign up. The second thing I'm so excited about is that normally we have a Christmas Eve service that we do on December 24th, Christmas Eve. But this year, we're going to do something a little bit different. We want to be able to gather, and so on the, we're going to get together outdoors for a time of caroling. Now, I know it's cold, I know it's December, but we know how to survive. We're Northeasterners, right? So we can wear our warmest clothes, we're going to have some fire pits to stand around, and we're just going to sing some Christmas carols together to celebrate the season. Now, this will take place on December 23rd, not Christmas Eve the 24th. And that's because we looked at the weather, and it looks better on the 23rd than it does on the 24th. So we would like to do it when the weather is better. We're going to do it on the 23rd, and then we always have the opportunity for a rain date if for some reason the weather doesn't turn out well that day. So December 23rd, plan on gathering, dress warm, bring whatever you have to do, those little hand warmer things you break and put in your gloves, whatever it is. We'll try to keep us warm with some fire pits and some other heaters, and uh, we'll just enjoy that time together. So now as we get into, the, get into our sermon, let me pray for us. Father, thank you that we have the opportunity to be together as a congregation, even if it's virtual. Lord, that we have the opportunity to encourage one another, that we have so many means of communication that the church, even 10 years ago, didn't have. And yet we have, Lord, now, and it feels to me so often that you have blessed the church with these many things because you knew that there would be times like this where maybe we weren't able to get together in person the way that we desire to. I pray, Lord, that you would be with us throughout this season. Be with us, Lord, as we come into your scripture today. May we see what your servant Paul and what Jesus tells us about love. Be with us, Lord, in your name. I want to start this morning by reading from John 15, verse 12 to 13. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. As I began to think about the fourth Advent candle of love, these were the words that kept coming to my mind, these words from Jesus. Greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. As I've done more than once in the last few weeks as we've looked at hope, peace, joy, and love, I've begun by asking the question, what is love? Or what is peace? What is joy? Well, this week it could be, what is love? And if I asked that question and started out that way, I don't think we'd have to go much further than Jesus' words here, that we need to love others the way that Christ loved us, and that Jesus says to his disciples, greater love is no, one, no man than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. And he's saying that as he's literally walking to the Garden of Gethsemane, preparing for his death. His disciples don't know that, but that's what he's talking about. Love the way that Jesus loved. Well, what is that? What does that mean? And so as I, those words were resonating with me, bouncing around in my head, I thought of another passage in Scripture that describes the love of Christ and where the, uh, Jesus' servant Paul shares with the church this instruction about how it is that we are to live the way that Christ lived, to love the way that Christ loved. And in this passage, Jesus' love is held out as an example and an encouragement of the type of love and the type of lives that we ought to be leading. And what's more, in this passage, we discover that the greatest example, perhaps, of this coming into play, of Jesus loving us, of God loving us, happens at the birth of Christ. So the passage we're going to look at today comes from Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, 
did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. When Jesus' words came to mind that greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for a friend, I began to grow bothered. Particularly as I considered those words in light of Christmas, in light of our cultural context, and then in light of Philippians 2. In Philippians 2, Paul encourages us to use Jesus Christ as an encouragement and example of the way that he lived and the way that we ought to live. And he tells us that in doing that, we will receive comfort and love. He says, and he desires for the church to have the same love. And then he proceeds to describe what that love is and what that love looks like. And central to his whole explanation is that Jesus empties himself of all that he is, giving up his claim to the divine throne, and that he's born in the likeness of man. God with us, Emmanuel. It's this profound example of self-giving love. And Paul in Philippians places this profound example of self-giving love right in the manger in Bethlehem. But what is it that we so often focus on at Christmas? Is it the giving? Is it living like this self-emptying act that we see? Or is it the receiving? Is it love or is it something else? I know we say things, you know, like, well, Christmas is the season for giving. But I wonder if we really mean it. For the past several years at Christmas, I try to read A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And I know that a lot of you really enjoy that story. And even if you don't read the book, there's a hundred different film versions of the story. There's plenty of themes to uncover in that small book. And it has made a significant impression on our cultural Christmas experience, despite the fact that it's just a really short story. It's a relatively quick read. The main storyline, of course, is that the main character, Ebenezer Scrooge, is this inwardly focused, self-focused miser who doesn't want to be generous. And and the story is about how he moves from that place of, of being miserly towards this place of being this generous person. And we look at it and we say, yeah, that's the spirit of Christmas, right? The spirit of giving. And the story lands with so many of us and has since it was written because we do see Christmas as a time for giving and when we have this idealistic view of what that is. But I think if we're honest, most of the time, even our giving is really about receiving. It's about what we'll get out of the experience. We're concerned with what we have or what we'll get. There, like There's almost this sense in culture that the reason we encourage giving And the reason we encourage others to give is because that if everybody around us is really giving, it means that we're going to receive. Like we almost have flipped it around. We're willing to participate, but only because we know that we'll get something back. In other words, I I think that we're less like Ebenezer Scrooge and we're more like Clark Griswold. And of course, that's another one of my favorite Christmas movies, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And, you know, Clark Griswold and the humor of Clark Griswold is that he looks like he's just this overly ambitious suburban father who wants what's best for his friends and his family. At Christmas, he invites everyone over, even the, even the annoying relatives. You know, he's welcoming to his wife's sister and her deadbeat husband. Uh, he, he even offers to buy them their Christmas gifts because he knows that they can't afford it. But then as you watch the movie, you see that underneath the story, this whole time, it's not really about what he can give. It's about him expecting what he's going to receive. It's about him getting his Christmas bonus. That's his motivation. And if he doesn't get it, and when he doesn't get it, the whole Christmas is ruined. You know, everything, is, everything blows up. The get, it was really never about the giving. Like The giving only flowed from what he was getting. This is why I said that as I thought of these words of Jesus, I began to get bothered by it. Because what Jesus is commanding and what Paul is instructing is something that runs so contrary to our cultural narrative and I think even to our experience personally of Christmas that sometimes it feels like we've missed the point and there's no return, that we're just too far gone. But that's not the gospel. It's never too late. 
And in fact, the example that has been set by Christ is precisely so that people like you and I, people who sometimes miss the point, can return to the comfort that Paul tells us is ours when we choose to love one another. The encouragement from Paul is in verse 5 when he says, have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, you, believer in Jesus Christ, have access to this type of love. You have access to the ability to turn from an inward-focused self-interest to an outward-focused, otherly-focused life. And you have it because in Jesus Christ, we have received the mind of Christ. This is why we can do it. No matter how far we feel like we've missed the mark when it comes to loving like Jesus did, as believers in Christ, we know that we have received the mind of Jesus Christ that he has earned for us and given to us through his life, death, and resurrection. But before we get into love, what love looks like, I want to point this out because I've pointed it out when we talked about peace and when we talked about joy. And now Paul makes the point for me here in Philippians 2 about love. Look at verse 1 to 2. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What Paul is saying to us is this, that there is a comfort and an encouragement that comes from our association with Christ. But if you want to live into that comfort and that encouragement, we need to participate in that love by loving those around us. When we live into the love that Jesus has commanded us to, we begin to experience His love towards us in return. That the more we love, the more we experience His love. Now, I want to be clear. We do not love so that Jesus would love us. That's the opposite of what Jesus is saying. We don't love in order to earn Jesus' love back towards us. The reason that we love others is because we have already been loved. And when we live into that calling to love others, the greater comfort an encouragement we receive is that we will be continually reminded of Christ's love for us that we already have in abundance. I could give you this story. I don't, I don't know why these articles have been popping up in my news feed. I don't know what I clicked to make the algorithm decide that I wanted to hear about professional golfers' first check, uh, their first winnings on tournament, their first deposit. But I've read several of these stories, and they're all essentially the same. You know, a professional golfer will work their whole life, you know, several years, and then they'll win a big tournament. And all of a sudden, they'll go to their ATM machine a couple days later, and their balance will show, you know, $750,000 or a million dollars in their checking account. And they always think that it's a, it's a joke. They think there's been a mistake. Even though, you know, in their heads, they know that they won the tournament. It's one thing to know I just won. It's another thing to show up to your ATM and see, oh, this is real. Like, I got to, my balance went up significantly and I don't know if about you, but I kept thinking to myself, if I pulled up to the ATM one day and I did my code and I hit balance check and it came back and I said like a million dollars, I think I might leave that receipt in the ATM and just see the guy's face behind me when he pulled up and got it. These stories of golfers, though, is that they keep going back to their ATM, right? They go check their receipt. They want to make sure that it's not a joke. But you know what really convinces them that it's not a joke? When they start spending it. They start to believe that it's there when they realize they can spend it. I mean, you want to know how much money you have? Start spending it. That's not a good financial strategy. I want you to be clear about that. But what it is, and what I'm trying to say, is that the only way to really believe and experience the comfort of that fortune, if you suddenly received a fortune that's in the bank, the only way to really experience the love and the comfort and the joy of that is to use it. You can leave it in the bank. And you might kind of know mentally that it's there, but you're never going to live in the joy and the comfort of it unless you go out and you begin to use it. And you realize that it's much more, there's much more there than you ever thought. That's the way it is with love and, and what we have with the comfort of love that we have in Christ. It's already been deposited. It's already in the account. And unlike even the biggest and most massive fortune, the more we draw from it, the balance doesn't move. It never goes down. We can never outspend the love that we have in Christ. But the only way to live into that assurance is to participate in it by loving others. Otherwise, it's just going to be a huge bank account that makes no difference to you. I think you can draw a direct line from this idea to Jesus' story about the master who, in this parable that he tells about a master who leaves his servants a certain amount of money or talents. And he leaves them treasure and 
he says, you know, do with it what you will, take care of my house. And he comes back and he finds that the first servant spent it, made more. The second servant spent it, made more. And he says, well done to those two. But the third servant takes it and he goes and he hides it. And I think that the reason, and of course he's kicked out of the kingdom. The master says, why have you done this? And I think one of the underlying things that's happening in this story is that the first two servants, it's not that they're afraid of losing what the master has given them. See, that's what the third servant says. The third servant says, well, I just hit it because I was afraid of losing it. The first two, they're not afraid of losing it. The reason they invest it is because they know they can't lose it. They know it's not a limited resource. They know that the master's resources are unlimited. So, of course, they're going to invest it. Of course, they're going to spend. But the third servant, see, he was a miser because he felt that the master's resources were limited and he was ultimately removed. The irony is that by keeping to himself what the master had given him, he ultimately ends up losing even that. Jesus' love is not a limited resource. But you won't know that until you step into the life of love that you are being called to. So what does that look like? What what does the love look like as Paul describes it? And I'm just going to make two marks of love that I see in this passage. The first mark of love is that you consider others more significant than yourself. If this was the only statement that Paul made, as he does in verse 3, it would be enough to demonstrate that the love of Christ runs absolutely contrary to the narrative of culture. Counting others more significant than yourself. I'm not sure it even enters most people's minds that they should consider others more significant than themselves. And it's not that people aren't willing to help others. right? It's not like people aren't willing to be generous. Most people aren't actually like Ebenezer Scrooge. I mean, if you remember the story, when, when the, guy, the people working in charity come into Ebenezer Scrooge, not only does he deny them, but he, he bashes their charity. And it's almost like this oddly familiar statement he makes about, well, why would I give? Can't other people take care of that problem? Can't the government take it? Or even he goes to the sense of, well, it's their fault, they're poor. Why should I help? Most people aren't like that. Most people, if asked, will respond in some way. If you ask them, would you be generous? Would you think of others? They'll give, even if it's just a little. The issue is that they don't give or won't be generous if asked, but the issue is that they don't think about it at all until they're asked. Never enters their mind. Considering others more significant than yourself, though, is not a behavior. It's a mindset. And so sometimes we go to these one-off events and we say, well, see, I was generous at Christmas time. And you say, yeah, but is it, a, is it a mindset that you have? Or are you just using this one-off to justify your own self-interest? Considering others more significant than yourself requires that we're willing to place ourselves constantly and consistently in a position of service to our neighbor. That we're constantly willing and at, to ask, what are their needs? Even as we consider our own. But we ask, what are their needs? In one of his most famous passages, C.S. Lewis famously writes, that humility is not, thinking less of our, is not thinking less of ourselves. It is thinking about ourselves less. It's not thinking less of ourselves. It's not making ourselves insignificant. It's just saying we don't think about ourselves anymore. We stop thinking about ourselves, and it frees us to think about others. That's what it really means to count others more, as more significant. The problem is, as Martin Luther said, the human heart has a tendency to turn inward on itself. That instead of loving others, it begins to love itself. And that's especially true when we go through times of difficulty or challenge. That in order to almost protect ourselves, our love gets wrapped back around inward on us. It happens when we're under stress, when we go through difficult days, to primarily think about our own needs, what we want, and what will make us happy. But if that's the tendency of the human heart, then what's the solution? Well, the solution is found in Christ. That's why Paul makes it clear that when we are participating in love, we are participating in the Spirit. That we are actually outworking what the Spirit is doing in our hearts. If we could simply learn to love others by correcting our own behavior, it would have been possible with the law. Same thing we said with joy. If you could have just followed the law of God and then been a loving person, then we would have done that. That would have been the standard. But no one can do that other than Jesus. And so Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, earns this for us, gives it to us in his spirit so that we can begin to love like Jesus loved. Loving others, considering others' needs ahead of our own, considering others more significant than ourselves requires a heart change 
that is only possible through the Holy Spirit. And then we go one step further to the second mark. And it's this, that we lay down our claims in obedience. Jesus literally sets aside his God-given right out of love. Now, Paul uses two words here, very intentionally, to make clear what he's saying. And those two words are likeness and equality. Paul uses these words to draw a contrast and a comparison between the way of Adam, which is the way of sin, and the way of Jesus, which is the way of love. And every single one of us are going to walk down one of these two paths. The way of Adam or the way of Christ. So the two words, likeness and equality. Adam was created to be like God. But Adam was not content with being like God. What Adam wanted was to be equal with God. He wanted equality with God. It was equality with God that he wanted to grasp and he grasps after it like he's grabbing the fruit off the tree. And if we were to admit it, we often walk in the way of Adam and we think to ourselves, I should be the center of the universe. I should be the one in control. I should be the sovereign one. And we grasp not after the likeness of God, but after equality with God. Jesus, on the other hand, actually is equal with God. The Son of God comes down in, person, in human form and becomes Jesus. Jesus is is, in the Son of God, is equal with God, but instead of grasping at that equality, He sets it aside. He lets it go. And instead, He becomes like Adam. Born in the likeness of man. Adam is like God, but grasps for equality. Jesus is equal with God, but lays it aside, becoming like a man. And then as a man in this life, consistently demonstrating this love, laying down his life for a friend, becoming obedient even to the point of death on a cross. But it's this moment, this birth, this moment that we celebrate at Christmas when one who is equal with God lays down his claim to his own rights and becomes like man. That's the message of Christmas. That is the demonstration of true love. And I can't help but wonder as we celebrate Christmas if our focus on receiving hasn't distracted us from the awe that we should have at the child in the manger. We have awe at Christmas. We have memories and we have things that we love and there are things that bring us joy and there are things that we focus on during the Christmas season, many of which are good, but I can't help but, in focusing on, but think that in focusing on all of those things, we miss the awe that we should have at the baby, Jesus, born in Bethlehem. Sometimes pastors argue over the dumbest things. Let me clarify. Very often, Pastors argue about the dumbest things. And listen, I get on message boards and things or on, on Facebook and I see what people argue about and it drives me crazy about some of the things that pastors will decide to go on a rant about. But one of the, one of the things I've seen pastors get really worked up about around the Christmas season, and I've probably talked about this before, is the song, Mary, Did You Know? For some reason, it really bothers pastors that this song is this question to Mary of whether or not Mary knew who Jesus was. Like, you know, they ask these questions, you know, Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Mary, did you know that when you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God? And so pastors will rip their hair out. Yes, of course she knew. Why are we asking these stupid questions? Yeah, she knew, she knew. But she didn't know everything. She didn't, she didn't know everything. She didn't know that you know, some of the questions in the song. She didn't know that Jesus would walk on water. She didn't know that Jesus would heal a blind man. She didn't know that Jesus would calm a storm. Whatever. I've, I've seen pastors get worked up about, Mary, did you know? But nobody seems to get too worked up about the terrible theology in Santa Claus is coming to town. That the better you are, you know, Santa's watching you, and the better you are, you know, you're going to get gifts. 
so you better be good for goodness sake. No, we save our energy for the poor theology of Mary, did you know? Well, here's the thing, and this is what I'm getting at and why I'm personally on team Mary, did you know? How would you have embraced and held the baby? Even, even if you knew that the baby Jesus in that manger was God incarnate, how would you have held the baby? See, I know that, like, there's a difference between knowing that this child that Mary's holding is God incarnate. The angel told her. She knew Jesus, Emmanuel. Okay. But it's another thing to know it. To have the assurance and the sense and the, and the confidence. And how could you as you held a baby? Those of you who have, have a newborn right now or who recently have had a newborn, you hold that baby and you know, this, this can't be. This can't be the creator of the universe come down in this child, childlike form. I mean, I know that the baby in the manger is Jesus, the Son of God. I know that it is God who has taken on the likeness of human form. I know that it is God incarnate. I know it. I've read the Bible. I believe it. But what Paul, and and if we take what Paul has just told us about Jesus, the story behind the story, the real story, and tell me if when you come to the manger, you acknowledge that this baby did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made Himself nothing. How can you even begin to wrap your head around that fact? How can you wrap your head around the idea that the Son of God, Creator of the heavens, the very Word of God, through whom nothing, has been, nothing was made that has been made, is now a wordless, speechless, helpless baby? Listen to the lyrics of Come and Stand Amazed that we sang last week. Come and stand amazed, you people. See how God is reconciled. See His plans of love accomplished. See His gift, this newborn child. See the mighty, weak, and tender. See the Word who now is mute. See the sovereign without splendor. See the fullness destitute. The Word who now is mute. And yet this thing that we cannot wrap our heads around, the thing that we know but don't really know, this, Paul says, is the example of love that we are to emulate. This is the model. This is what love is. This is what it looks like to count others as more significant than yourself or to put others' interests ahead of your own. This is what it looks like to live in humility. This is love. Well, what are we even supposed to do with that? What does that mean for us? If that's true, doesn't it cheapen even the most expensive gift that you've ever given or even the most expensive gift you've ever received? I mean, even if you're about to have one of those, one of those Christmases where a car miraculously shows up in the driveway with a bow on top of it, you know, maybe, maybe you're going to have one of those Christmases where you get the Mercedes-Benz with a bow on it. I don't... I have so many questions. I've only seen it in commercials. I, I want to know if they include the bow. Like, is that an extra add-on purchase? Does someone deliver it? How unobservant do you have to be to not see a new car in the driveway until Christmas morning? I don't know. But even if that's your Christmas, even if that's the, the most expensive thing, no matter what the car cost, no matter what you had to pay, it pales in comparison to what Paul is telling us Jesus did in the Incarnation. Because it cost Jesus everything. He had to give up his title, his reputation, his position. A friend of mine told me a story about what he did when he sensed his son was walking away from the faith. And I hesitate to share this story because I don't even know if he would tell it. His son had seen his dad in ministry for a long time. And he began to take a toll on both his father, but also on him, as he saw how, unfortunately, Christians can be mean, especially when you're in a position of influence. And so his son wanted nothing to do with the church, and the father perceived that not only did the son want nothing to do with the church, but he may have not wanted anything to do with Jesus. So the father resigned. He gave up his position and his title. 
He gave up the accolades. He turned down the publishers who were giving him a blank check to write another bestseller. He turned it down. And he walked away. And he said to his son, now it's about you. What do you want to do? If you want to run to the ends of the earth, I'll go with you. If you want to start something new, we'll start it together. If you want to hang out on the beach, we'll hang out on the beach. But I'm going to come and be with you. That's what love looks like. It looks like laying down everything that we have claim to, everything that we have the right to in order to demonstrate love to others. And it makes me wonder, why does love cost so much? Why does loving others, if we're going to live into the way that Paul calls us to, why does it cost so much? Why can't it be easier? I think what Paul would say to us is this, that until you are willing to give up everything to love others, you will never understand how much it costs Jesus to love you. You'll never understand the value of Jesus' love. You'll never live in its comfort if you never understand how much it really is worth. So in a few days, we celebrate what love costs. But can I tell you something else to look out for this Christmas season? I started by saying that I was bothered by what seems like a divergence between our cultural narrative of how we're supposed to treat or see the Christmas season and what Jesus tells us how we're supposed to view love and what Paul tells us about love. And you can get frustrated by that. Sometimes it's frustrating. But you know what encourages me? And even sometimes brings me to the point of laughter. In almost every Christmas movie, inevitably, the characters break into song, right? They break into singing Christmas carols. And I watch these Christmas movies, and all of a sudden, a Christmas movie produced by a pagan company with actors who probably, for the most part, don't acknowledge Jesus, written by a writer who probably did not have Christian themes in mind, all of a sudden, in this movie, they begin to sing these Christmas carols, a movie that has nothing to do with Jesus. All of a sudden they start singing about Jesus of Nazareth born in Bethlehem. They start singing a Christmas carol about Jesus without even knowing it. They're glorifying and honoring the name of Jesus. And isn't that what Paul had said? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every now and again, we get a glimpse of that happening as people, without knowing it, are declaring that this baby Jesus is the Son of God. This is what Christmas is. In this small child, this baby Jesus, we see God become like man. What did it cost him? Everything. Everything. Because that's what love is. And that's the gospel. Let's pray. Father, I know that as a church, we cannot walk away from this message and expect to simply implement it. We cannot leave and simply decide we're going to change our behavior and this is who we are now. No, Lord, what this will require of us is that the spirit you have given us will change our hearts, will transform our mindset to consider others more significant than ourselves, to love others, to lay down our own claims so that others can be lifted up. And Father, as we do that, may we experience the comfort of your love. I pray these things in your name, Lord. Amen.
As I said in my prayer, I know that for us to go out and implement everything that we talked about today is going to require the Spirit to change our hearts. So I hope that even as we go out and we try to emulate the work of Jesus Christ, that we recognize that this is a heart transformation that needs to take place and not just a behavioral one. But I pray that it would lead us and cause us to go and live lives of love. And this season, as we stand and we look at the child in the manger, as we look at Jesus, we would stand in awe and realize this act of love, that this is God who has become like man. Now, if there's anything else you need from us, any prayer requests, you can do all of that on our website, restoreworship.org. We hope, I look forward to seeing you this week, December 23rd, for our Christmas caroling service. We love you, we're praying for you, and I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Let's pray. Father, as we go out now, I pray that we would experience the joy of this season and we would experience it for all the right reasons, that we would recognize the presence of your Son with us, that God is with us. Be with us, Lord, in your name.